So continuing, um, I was talking about the law and justice party, right? So uh, it has it had to do. Uh, uh, <coughs> it was both for most more traditional, you know, uh, moral values and so on, but also uh, protection, social protection, social benefits for the people, not such a brutal, you know, trans shock transition and so on. So you see, this doesn't, you know. Right and left is not the same as, as it means here. The Polish tradition of a strong state in service of the nation, you know, nationalism means a strong state. The state should serve the nation, so benefits for the people, helping the people, helping the nation is part of the right wing values, center right values, okay? Uh, you know, not wild privatization and whatever, free market and so on. See, I mean, it's still free market, but it's not, it's, it's more of a social market, more of a, with social protections and so on, right? So that's why justice. Then you have a self-defense of the Republic of Poland, which is basically nationalist and isolationist. Uh, again, has to do, think of the fact that, you know, Poland is very homogenous ethnically, right? With some German minority, but much smaller than it used to be. Uh, the Jews have been eliminated in World War II, unfortunately, and all, the, all those things. <coughs> Self-defense reflects this sort of a homogenous nature, and it's, it's more, you know, inward-looking, you know, like us alone and so on was. A League of Polish Families, a more clerical, um, uh, and, uh, you know, more to the right and so on. So these are new, new, uh, new forces uh, here. Okay, so notice that who forms the government again center left with the Polish Peasants Party, and again we have a case of unified government in which the president Kwasniewski is from the same center left as the parties uh, in the government. Uh, although, remember, Polish Peasants Party is a center right party, Christian Democratic. But I'm talking about SLD. Then, uh, so same Senate, you have the presidential elections in 2005. Kwasniewski can run again because you know the two mandates are off. Are, uh, and Notice who wins, Lech Kaczynski of the Law and Justice Party, again the pendulum, right? So in 2005 it's Lech Kaczynski who wins, uh, in, uh, actually with a turnaround in the second round because in the first round he got less than Donald Tusk. Now not, the, notice the two major parties here uh, running candidates are the Civic Platform and Law and Justice. Uh, Law and Justice, I just described it, it's a center-right party, more traditionalist, more, you know, and in the, in the economy, the state would have more role in protecting the people. Civic platform is also center right, but more pro European. A law and justice is more Euro skeptic, meaning less inclined in giving up sovereignty to the European Union, uh, which is what the European Union is about sharing sovereignty. Uh, so, more skeptical in that sense. The civic platform is more pro European, but also more free market, more liberalizing, uh, and so on. So, neoliberal in the sense of uh, economics, uh, free market, and free inter enterprise, and uh, you know, no reg less regulation, lower taxes, and so on. While the law and justice is more taxes, more protections for the people. But also, uh, civic platform center right, but less inclined on harping or, or putting too much emphasis on the, on the, uh, on the values part, right? So, it's, it's more moderate, so to speak, on that side. So you see both center-right parties, but one is more pro-European, pro-economic pro, uh, uh, reforms, and the other one is more Eurosceptic and more uh, state role in the economy. These are the two major actors. You see that the whole platform, the whole political sphere, is actually basically on the right, on the center-right. That's where most of the population are in Poland. See. Then you have the self-defense, which is even more so, even more to the right, more isolation. Again, right and left, we have to understand these are very relative terms. So we have to understand them in this specific context. I told you, more isolationist. Um, meanwhile, notice one thing, where is the SLD? Where is SLD? Where are the reform comments? They fell apart. They fell apart with accusations, again, of corruption, and also because they continued those, you know, economic reforms that people hated and so on. So corruption, it all fall, fell apart. Okay, 2005 also sees parliamentary elections. And here's the interesting thing, that uh, parliamentary elections actually happened earlier, they don't happen at the same time, even if it's the same year. So it happened earlier than the presidential elections. And uh, it took a while to form a government. Notice who are the important parties. Law and Justice, Civic Platform, which was described, then it comes the Self-Defense. Notice that these are all new names, basically, in the last four years they came about. 
Uh, then you have democratic SLD, which has lost a tremendous amount. Uh, League of Polish Families, which is also a new party, and Polish Presence Party, a constant, relatively you know, moderate presence, but always there in Parliament. And it's because it's better institutionalized, and it's sort of a moderate uh, party. Center-right, Christian Democratic, but it's sort of in the middle. Okay, now why do law and justice form a government? Remember that the, the division was between former communists versus center-right opposition. Now, the former communists are removed from power. Why not these two major parties on the center-right to form a coalition? Simply, they swapped. Simply, they did not get along. Because again, getting along, compromising, is a skill that, you know, it's never learned, actually. Look at recent developments in US politics, you know, changing the Speaker of the House, although one party controls it, and still they can't agree on who should be the Speaker. Because, you know, there are divergences. But also, because, Another feature of Polish parties, but not only in Central Eastern European parties after 89, is that, as I said, and your book mentions, it, they're less ideologically clear and more formed around personalities. And this is also has to do with this issue of institutionalization, that parties are not well institutionalized. Because if they're institutionalized, they have a life on its own. If they only depend on the, whoever is the leader, right, that guy is, uh, falls in disgrace, the whole party falls apart, right? Uh, this, this ideological, and it also has to do with that the, the Polish society has not coalesced into different ideologies. Perhaps it's better this way. But that's the case. So they could not agree to form a government, although they could have formed easily a majority, the two of them together. Okay. They could not. So that's one. Second thing, notice, remember who won the election. Uh, uh, um, uh, who, was the, who won the, the uh, 2005 election? Um, uh, presidential uh, presidential uh, election. Lech Kaczynski. Lech Kaczynski. Now, as your book mentions it, and famously, he is actually a twin, Lech Kaczynski, twin brother of Jaroslav Kaczynski, both of them founders of the Law and Justice Party. Famously, they used to be child actors, but uh, in, uh, during communism and so on. Uh, so they both are the leaders of this party. One of them, Lech Kaczynski, wins the presidential election in 2005. His brother was one of the leaders of the party who led it to victory in the parliament. Right? Well, guess what happens? Here's again where a semi-presidential system matters. This is a case where you don't have a clear majority. Right? And this is when the president, even a weaker president in a semi-presidential system, since he has the power to nominate, to choose whom to nominate as PM, he can force the formation of a certain coalition. And that's what happens. As you will support line, it was a more turbulent, you know, few months until this happened. But eventually, eventually, you have the Law and Justice Party forming a government with these more extreme, right? Not extreme. It's not extreme, not fascist, anything, but more to the right parties, and it's not going to last much. But notice that the important thing here is the impact of the semi-presidential model on shaping the results of an and by the way, who's going to become prime minister? His twin brother. Okay? His twin brother. So the president is Lech Kaczynski, PM is Jaroslav Kaczynski. Uh, that's around the middle of 2006 is when this this, this thing took. Again, took several months to uh, arrange this. So that's what happens. It's unified government in so many ways, right? It's in the same family uh, in 2005. And then you have. Um, the next parliamentary elections are, you see, again, early elections, because normally they should have been in 2009, no, they're in 2007, why? Because that coalition did not last long. Those parties were too radical, which means that they, you know, they were shaped on the image of the leaders. So leaders who are such radical leaders, you know, they have a strong temperament, they, they will not get along. And parties that are very pure ideologically, they are less inclined to compromise. So, and without compromise, there's no politics, because you always need to form coalitions, whether within a party or between parties, right? Such ideologically pure uh, leaders, although it sounds good that I want it to be, you know, clearly this way, yeah, but politics doesn't work that way. So the coalition will fall apart, plus again, corruption allegations, and you have new elections, and again a center-right party, but the other center-right party, the pro-European, pro-market, whatever, party comes to power, civic platform, with this 
peasants party who is such a moderate party that it can get allied itself with whichever side. Okay, so now you again have cohabitation, right? With a, a very strong personality president, kind of on the Valesa model, and also a strong PM in the person of Donald Tusk. Okay, 2010, you have presidential elections, why? But early presidential elections, it should have been, yeah, around this time, but early. Why? Because you have the famous catastrophe, the famous tragedy of Smolensk. Uh, you have the famous tragedy of Smolensk. What happened? Right? The president, uh, in 2000, early 2010, what, you know, elections were looming, and uh, Lech Kaczynski, the brother who was the president, uh, flew with a huge delegation, including his wife and military commanders and governmental, so a huge governmental delegation to Katyn, to Katyn, uh, to the site where the Soviet Union massacred, well, I think, 6,000, the cream, the elite of the old Polish army at the beginning of World War II, one of the great crimes of the Soviet Union against Poland. And uh, they flew there in order to, it was part of a process of, of kind of mending relationships with, uh, with Russia, and Russia acknowledging its guilt, you know, of, in that event. And it was part of this sort of uh, the, the commemoration of this tragic event in Polish history when the plane that was leading there crashed, killing the president and all this Polish governmental belief in 2010. I mean, imagine. Imagine you're, they're flying there to commemorate this tragic event in Polish history, and another tragic event happens and takes the lives of Polish. You can imagine the aftermath. At this point, Lech Kaczynski was not actually very popular. He wasn't, probably wasn't going to win re-election. And again, because of his aggressive style, he wasn't that popular. But imagine the aftermath, imagine the conspiracy theories that have never gone away since, you know? Like, you're flying there, who was to blame that the plane crashed? Seemingly weather and so on, but was it the Russian uh, air controls? Was it the Russian plot? I mean, it's on and on and on. Uh, so, uh, so, it's still an issue in Polish politics. Plus, Jaroslav Kaczynski, who is the, you know, right, the leader of the law and justice, you know, the twin brother, he lost his twin brother, you can imagine. Uh, so anyway, 2010 you have elections and it's the civic platform candidate for the president who wins. So in 2010 you suddenly have uh, again unified government with the president from the civic platform and a prime minister Donald Tusk and government majority from the civic platform. Remember pro-European, pro-reform and so on. And uh, notice another thing that this is 2010. What happened meanwhile? 2008, 2007 the big economic crisis that hit all the countries, you know, in Europe, the US, and so on, and around the world. Poland has fared, has, has, was one of the countries that has fared the best through the economic crisis. Canada was another one. The best, because it was not as vulnerable to these market fluctuations. Have had, the banks have had not, you know, haven't have been burdened, have not been burdened with all these loans, uh, cheap loans that they gave up to the population, which led to the crisis. You know, so there wasn't a real estate bubble as there was in, in, in the US or Spain or Ireland. So the banking system survived, Poland survived, and actually fared the best of all the countries in Europe. Of all the countries in Europe. So that's a huge thing, right? Poland did not suffer the consequences of the economic crisis in 2008. Um, and you can read more about that. Um, so, anyway, uh, 2010. And next elections are, however, 2011. Right, 2011, because the things that Poland has fared well through the economic crisis, for the first time since 1989, the same party is re-elected for a majority in parliament, the civic platform in the Polish Peasant Party, still Donald Tusk, the first prime minister to be re-elected. Not president, because we already had that, but the first majority to be re-elected in parliament. That gives you a sense of, oh, Polish stability. There is stability. Well, yes and no. And again, you see new party. First of all, self-defense has disappeared, League of Polish Families have disappeared, fragmentation and fluctuation, fluidity continues. Palikot's movement, what is Palikot's movement? And you will see this. Uh, this is part of another trend in Central Eastern European politics 25 years after 1989. Remember 1989 was about what? 
We're going to remove the communists and we're going to get everything together. Freedom, right? Political freedom, democracy, prosperity, market, and Europe. And this is all going to happen together because all of it was, you know, blocked by this thing, communism. And now we remove it and it will all fall into place. Well, it turns out it didn't. Plus the expectations were, you know, overnight and we're going to live like the people in the Western Europe. Remember that Western Europe and all these countries have taken decades and more, uh, maybe centuries, to get where they are. Right? But you want to be there immediately. And it's a huge trauma when you don't. So, plus, again, the mess, the chaos of the transition, right? So, what you have towards the end of the 2010s, 2000s actually, towards 2010, is the emergence in many of these countries of a sort of reform, rethinking, and uh, not quite anti-system, but anti-status quo parties. And not only in Central Europe, by the way. There is a sort of a fatigue with representative democracy throughout the world. Think of Tea Party. Think of Occupy Movement. It's this idea that things, the whole system is, is just junk. Let's just throw it, you know, we need something else. So it, it's happening, you know, Italy has had similar. So it's happening everywhere, but in Central and Eastern Europe, it has to be, it has more, uh, closer, has that, but it also has relationships with 1989. We had the revolution in 1989, but did we actually transform? Did we transform to where we want to go? But where do we want to go? You see, these things are not settled, you know. The, okay, we have democracy, but what have we, you know, what did we get from this democracy, right? Pa many people, you know, have suffered the transition, the economic transition, not the political. And the, in the mind of the, you know, people, it's, this is not separate, separated, right? You know, because one is the political transition, the other one is the economic transition. This is why we talked about them differently. This is why I ask you to pay attention to different things, because they're not the same. They're linked, but not the same. And one might be very successful, but the other one, although they're linked, right, might not be, or the other way around. Okay, so uh, you have then um, um, groups forming in most of the countries in Central Eastern Europe, or many of them, that will try to propose a complete reform or, or go against the elite. elite. And by the elite I mean all those people who have been in, entered politics after 1999 and kind of remained there. Because many of these parties that, okay, their names change, but the people are kind of the same. The figures that come in and out, the elite, the political elite that was formed after 1999, that kind of remain the same, although, you know, it moves around in, in, in part. There's a sense then in these, uh, in the population in many of these countries that were part of them, that the elites have failed us, that politics has failed us. There's a large cynicism about politics, you know, because, you know, high expectations bring the, you know, the higher expectations, the, the lower the fall, right? And it's, it's inevitable that the higher you put your expectations that you will fall because they are only, always unrealistic, always unrealistic, high expectations, you know. Think hope and change or whatever it is, right? Although I have no qualms about any political party in America, but the point is, this is a familiar uh, phenomenon. Okay, uh, so Palikot's movement was one of these. Okay, who's Palikot? What does it mean? He's a guy, right? He's a person, right? And he is one of these anti-system. He's actually anti-clerical, most mostly anti, you know, these these uh, Catholic values and so on. Why? Because he's proposing a. He's not proposing. He's he's situating himself against, right? Against whatever he says is the system. Okay, it will go away, by Okay, 2011, 2015, the latest election is actually just a few months ago. The parliamentary was last month, the presidential was earlier this year in May. So what do we have? We have again a pendulum swing, but notice that the swing now is on the center right. It's between law and justice and civic platform. Law and justice, civic platform. Law and justice wins the presidency. Andrzej Duda wins the presidency against the civic platform, so, you know, SLD, Social Democrats, have disappeared. Corruption falling apart, everything, okay? So it's on the center-right entire spectrum, and in Parliament, which was just recently, a law and justice wins alone majority, both in the Senate, uh, wins majority in the, in the Senate, which is, which is, which is, Unbelievable, and also in the in the same, two thirty-five or four sixty, sixty-one out of one hundred, 
first time since 1989. Actually, in a multi-party system, this is extraordinary. This is extraordinary for a party to win the majority in, uh, in Parliament, right? And they win the majority. Now, who is Lion Johnson? You know, we talked about Lion Johnson, but who is, who are the actors, right? Now, the president is Andrzej Duda. Uh, the prime minister is a, is a lady who was appointed just recently, a few weeks ago. Uh, but Jaroslav Kaczynski, the twin brother of the former president, is actually the leader of the party. He's in neither of these positions because he's a sort of a controversial figure, a very powerful personality. Okay, and a lot of the parties was shaped by him and his brother. Uh, Personality-driven politics. Uh, but he's kind of the boss of the party. He's really the boss more than the president and the prime minister. Interesting situation. Um, but anyway, so the, the second largest party is the civic platform against center-right. Civic platform which might fall apart, uh, and you have that article I posted about, the second two articles about the aftermath of Polish, Polish elections, which I to read. But notice, again, new actors, because Polish politics, fragmented, fluctuating, fluid. Cookies, which is again, what does it mean, cookies? It's a name of a person, right? He's actually, um, uh, if, I'm not, uh, if I'm not mistaken, an actor. Anyway, one, just like Palikot is one of these people who led a sort of an anti-system, not anti-system, anti-status quo, sort of a populist is a, the word for it. You know, you kind of feed on the, di on the disappointment or anger or disillusion of the population and channel it, just like a Tea Party or uh, Occupy movement. That, that's what Cookies is, that Palikot was, you see, Palikot disappeared. Now, how long can these last? They don't last long, because such populist movements don't have a strong ideology, they have, they are clear what they are against, they are clear that they are feeding on discontent, but again, the question in politics is what are the policy goals? Besides, remove the guys, throw them out. So Cookies is one of them, but notice what a good result, and also he fared well in the presidential election. Uh, look, he came in third, with 20%. It gives you a sense that there is a large discontent in the population. Uh, and then you have mod Modem, or, or uh, uh, a modern, uh, which is um, a center-right, more liberal in the classical sense, meaning economically liberal, meaning free market. Why do you need modern when you have civic platform? Because civic platform has kind of pulled back from their pro-market whatever uh, things. It's actually led, modern is uh, led by Richard Petru, which who is an economist, and he's more you know, free market, whatever. So he addresses part of the former electorate of the civic platform, those who were more for, uh, you know, urban, more successful entrepreneurs, always smaller niche of the population, but kind of, you know, one who want a modern, think of the name modern, right? Modern, modern, urban, successful, entrepreneurial, free market, whatever. You have the Polish People's Party, the Peasants Party, never goes away, and the German minority, which always wins, about one or two seats, because one um, uh, prescription of the Polish uh, system is that there is a 5% threshold for all parties to get into the parliament, except for the ethnic minorities. Most of the countries we talked about this are multi-ethnic in Poland, uh, in, in Central Eastern Europe. Uh, and they all, because of the democratic principle, they want to reflect this in politics. So they either reserve certain seats to the ethnic minority, Right or have some other prescriptions. The prescription in Poland is to, you know, to solve to address this problem. Right is the method is self-government representation, and the way they solve it is that yes, you will have to run in elections. We're not going to guarantee you a seat, but you don't have to fit the five percent rule because we, you know, you need to represent that different part, ethnic part, right, which is not part of the Polish nation. Um, if you would put it a threshold, it would not get represented, but you still make it play the parliamentary, the electoral game. So it, it, it needs only uh, it, it, the enough votes to get uh, a seat, for example, right? Uh, so it doesn't have to have 5%, and that they get. And that they have been present since 1989. So that's the situation today. So as you see, in Poland, what have been then the major issues uh, uh, that uh, we have covered in Polish politics since 1989? 
Well, one major issue has been the pro-communist, anti-communist, the major cleavage. And remember, we defined cleavage in the previous uh, lecture, right? The major cleavage in Polish society, which would be reflected in politics, was in the 90s especially the pro and anti-communist, the opposition versus communist. And this cleavage will also be present in other countries. Uh, um, then there is another regional cleavage, which this is why in the canvas material I also either uh, indicated that you should uh, check the um, uh, regional map of elections, because you will see that there is a clear distinction between the West and the East, and this is sort of original cleavage is also present in other countries in Central and Eastern Europe. So you see commonalities, meaning that the East is less developed. Again, think history, think culture. This East used to be part of the Russian Empire, the West, the Austrian or Prussian. Remember what we have discussed. But you see, and these cleavages fall within the countries. Uh, so in Poland, the East is more less developed, more rural. Uh, less industrialized, West is more urban, more industrialized, more developed, economically better. They will vote differently, of course. Right? They will vote differently. So in the last election you will see that the civic platform, not by chance, is mostly one in the West, while the law and justice, more of the ordering, whatever, in the East part. Right? So that's not a cleavage, important uh, cleavage. What other issues we need to mention about Polish politics? Right? So characteristics, fragmentation, fluidity. Right. Uh, what else uh, did, we, did, we, did we say, so, you know, always personalities driven parties, weakly institutionalized, the issue of corruption which go, is still around, you know, it's still, parties are <coughs> voted out because they're perceived, rightly or wrongly, as corrupt. Um, also, as I said, non non, a lack of clearly ideologically defined parties and more personalities uh, uh, driven. Another issue I mentioned was this issue of dealing with the communist past uh, in many ways. It's effects, it's the past, clarifying the past, because it has to do with clarifying who we are and what we are, creating clear narratives uh, and uh, so on. Today, what is the, 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 as you see, the Polish spectrum, the Polish culture seems to be situated com comfort, mostly comfortably in the center, center right. That's where all, most of the voters are. You know, parties. When they come to win votes, here's how votes are distributed always in a society, right? It's more at the center and less at the extremes. But what this, these extremes mean differs from party to party. And we could say that most of the Polish electorate is actually on the center, right? If we take it in general, like European, what is right, what is left. I would argue that most of the electorate is here, which means that the two major parties today are the civic platform, and then law and justice. And all of them are actually on the right, because most of the Polish record is on the, uh, on the, you know, the traditional right, so to speak. Uh, okay, so that's another interesting thing, right? Civic platform, more pro-European, pro-market, still center-right, law and justice, less pro-European, more state role, but again, very traditional values and so on. Okay, a few more issues. This is about Polish politics and political culture. A few more issues to mention. 1999, together with the Czech Republic and Hungary, Poland enters NATO. It's a member of NATO. Uh, 2004, together with those countries and ten, uh, seven more, they enter the European Union. Today, actually, Poland is one of the largest countries in the European Union. And since representation in the institutions of the European Union is based on the population to a good degree, Poland has a very strong voice at the level of the European Union. Um, then, in terms of foreign relations, there has been a tradi tradition of good relations with the U.S. also because of a large Polish diaspora here. Uh, also, friendship with France, it all goes, it goes back to the 19th century and the freedom fighters and whatever. Uh, the obsessions with Russia and Germany continue because, remember, Polish history has been shaped by being exactly between the two. Literally, all of the other countries have been there, but this is right in the middle of it. So this. And now, with the recent aggressive moves from Russia, uh, invading part of Ukraine, which has been historically part of Poland, the western part, remember, uh, the western part of Ukraine. If, uh, so Poland is, feel, feels threatened, and rightly so, to a degree, because, well, here's, here's what's going on. Uh, so, uh, very wary, and one of the important voices in NATO and the European Union to be more aggressive against Russia. Uh, with Germany, 
relationships have, have fluctuated, and it has been depending on who was in government. The civic platform was more friendly and more closer with Germany, law and justice less. Okay, um, the military. Because of its position, it's interesting that Poland is one of the few, maybe the only country in Central Europe that has invested massively in its military. Since it's a large country in terms of population, it also has a large military and it has put, up, put in a lot of money into the military. It has developed a strong military. Because, this, remember, Polish state disappeared for 150 years. There is a clear, you know, this is not an impossibility. They have lived it, okay, recently, less than 100 years ago. Uh, about 100 years ago. Okay. Um, so, in principle, there could be people who have lived there, actually, who were born there. And uh, finally, one more thing uh, is uh, Visegrad 4. The Visegrad 4, who is this, uh, which is this um, uh, alliance, so to speak, of the four Central European countries, Poland, Czech, Slovakia, and Hungary, which goes back in history. Uh, the Visegrad is a symbolic name, we're going to talk about this uh, further. Uh, which has started in the 90s as a sort of a way of uh, um, putting their efforts together with the goal of, uh, of lobbying for their integration in the European Union and NATO. Uh, actually, at that point, it wasn't that efficient because the Czechs were way ahead and didn't want to be dragged down by the rest. But nowadays, it has become a very efficient and more active, even militarily, uh, cooperation, this Visegrad 4, and the, the new government of uh, Poland, the Law and Justice government, actually has made regional cooperation, especially this Visegrad 4, one of the key elements of its foreign policy. So that's about the review of Poland today.